G'day you mob, how's it going? Welcome to this episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. Today is part three of my interview series with my mate, Ross McGibbon. He is a reptile photographer, lives over in Western Australia near Perth and goes on these epic trips every single year around the country taking absolutely phenomenal photos of geckos, lizards, but primarily venomous snakes. So, today we talk about the different trips that he's been on in 2021 whilst COVID's been ravaging the rest of the continent. WA, Western Australia has been sort of, you know, business as usual. And we go through some of the really interesting photos that he took and how he got these photos. You know, how did he set them up? How did he find these animals? So, guys, don't forget that Ross is doing a sale on his reptile calendar for 2022. So, if you want a calendar for next year that's full of absolutely beautiful photos of different reptiles from around Australia, get your hands on this. And don't forget that 25% of the proceeds are being donated to the Royal Flying Doctors Service. That is a service in Australia that flies into remote parts of the continent to help people who get injured or get bitten by a snake like Ross was in the past. And the Global Snake Bite Initiative, which is a non-profit charitable organization working hard on many levels to ease the burden of snake bite around the world. So, without any further ado, guys, I give you Ross McGibbon. Just for the sake of it. But <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, so ra- rant over. <laughs> you were going through all of this, but you still managed to pump out a um, 2022 calendar of your 12 best shots for the year. Yep. How much work and effort went into creating this calendar? You know, is it something that you can ever really calculate or summarize? Well, to put it into perspective, um, I, first I have to go out and get the shots. So, there's thousands of dollars, days, weeks out there in in the wild photographing. And, you know, I would do that regardless of selling any prints, any calendars. I would do that for me and my own collection. Mm-hmm. Um, as you can see, I got my images up on my wall everywhere. People come into my room and they'll- You'll see the one behind oh, his head is actually oh, on the front of a book. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little little pan. That's oh, my- wow. uh, that's my three Taipan species in Australia. The middle one is the one I got in Australian Geographic for. Um, this is actually in the calendar. Is that a um, a dugite? No, nah, this is a spotted mulga snake, and uh... they only occur only occur in um, kind of the Murchison and um, Northern Goldfields regions of Western Australia. And, um, to, to explain these photos for people who are listening and not watching the video, and obviously you can go and check out the video, just go to the website and you'll, you'll see it there with the podcast. But Ross kind of takes different style photos of these animals from your average reptile photographer. I remember growing up and reading, um, I think it's Cogga, right? Cogga yep. is the surname of the guy who pretty much wrote the book on, literally, on um, Australian reptiles. So, he has all the <laughs> yeah. photos of the different lizards. I think the Bible. Herps, right? Yeah. So, there's, there's um, you've got amphibians in there and you've got reptiles in there. And so, you can see the distributions, what they look like. But all the photos tend to be sort of like from above looking down straight onto the animal or- maybe a distance shot where they've kind of, you know, used a uh, zoom lens to be able to get, you know, say a venomous snake. Ross, on the other hand, kind of gets right up into the face of the animal, like literally with a wide angle lens, but gives you so much more context in terms of the environment in which the animal's in. But in order to what do the animal justice, you have to use a wide angle lens so that you get the entire animal in the photo big, but you also get all of the background, you know, usually trees and dirt and rocks and, and sunsets or sunrises. So, it, it's they are phenomenal photos. Do you, are there any others, that, any other Australians you see going around taking these kinds of photos? Yeah. And, and to be honest, I wasn't the, I wasn't the one who invented wide angle photography <laughs> for, for, for reptiles. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there were other photographers dabbling in in wide angle photography uh, when I started, and I remember looking at what was out there, and and most reptile photographers were just taking what we call identification shots, yep. and that's what that's what you're describing. Yeah. If you open any reptile field guide, you'll see a close, you'll see a snake curled up, and you can hopefully see its tail and its head. Yeah. And it and it's taken from a forty five degree angle, 
And that's basically called an identification shot. And that's great for identifying the diagnostics of that snake. But because I had a passion for photography that predated um, starting with photographing reptiles, um, probably the style that I liked the most was landscape photography. I just thought landscape photography was the most beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if there was no reptiles in the world or wildlife, I'd be doing landscape photography because it's essentially the same thing. You're out there in nature, traveling for your passion, um, going to places that you would never usually go unless you're looking for something or trying to find the perfect shot. It's just that I have this passion for reptiles dating back from when I was a kid. So I tied all of it in together. And like I said, I wasn't the first person who invented wide angle photography with reptiles. But I thought to myself, imagine if I could get a landscape style shot with the reptile in it. And that's the formula that I go for. And um, yeah, I've just been quite successful at it. Um, my, my eye for photography really helps me, but I'm able to tie in all the the reptile stuff as well because I am a venomous snake handler. I can get close to them. I can read their behavior. So Most of the time. <laughs> most of the time, yeah. Except yep. when they're cheeky and give you a little nip. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's happened a total of three times. And yep. only, only one of those was uh, a dangerously venomous snake and it wasn't during photography. So I, I boast a, um, you know, a, a no-bite venomous snake um, record with photography. It was uh, just the fact that I was trying to get a small snake off the road on a hot night and um, successfully did it the first time. It came back on the road and I hurried the grab and, yeah, the rest is history. If anyone wants to know more about that story, just head over to my social media. and We've um, talked about it previously on the podcast, I think, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, what, think, I think it might have been one of our first or second episodes we talked about that. We'll, we'll get back to the calendar, but what does it actually feel like to be mm. bitten by a venomous snake? I mean, not necessarily the... I mean, you can talk about the emotion of it because I'm sure you shit yourself soon afterwards, but do you actually feel it? Uh, yeah, so some snakes have um, venom that induces pain and yeah. others, do others don't. So... Um, black snake, like the red belly black and the tiger snake, um, well, tiger snake's not a black snake, but the tiger snake and black snakes, they have painful venom because it actually starts to, um, eat away at some of the tissue. You can get local necrosis, not, not anything compared to like rattlesnakes and some of the vipers mm -hmm. overseas, but you can get local necrosis with black snakes just because they got properties in their venom that destroys tissue. Yeah. Um, and that's painful. So uh, when I got bitten, it was by a mulga snake, which is a black snake. And um, within about 30 seconds, I started to notice pain. So that that's how you can, that's one way you know that you haven't received a dry bite. Yeah. Uh, because I knew that snake had painful venom. And if I hadn't have felt pain, the onset of pain, I would have just kept going about my business. But yep. that's, that's me having the prior knowledge to be able to do that. I wouldn't recommend anyone else ever try and wait out a bite if you think you've been bitten get to get to medical attention yeah far out anyway so back to this year's well the coming year's calendar um do you want to mention some of the animals that you got in here and perhaps tell us some of the interesting stories about how you ended up finding yeah. them you know was was there any that were really really difficult to find any seren what would you say serendipitous events where they just whoa you know there's the one i was after the whole time i've been looking for months and then boom as soon as i went home he, he was in my garden you know <laughs> well, well look I'll, I'll start with uh the cover shot yeah and um this yeah. this cover shot is of the black-headed python and this literally looks like my pet snake kenny from back in the day so yeah phenomenal and yeah. this is at night by the looks of it so this is at night and i'd been working on figuring out my long exposure um nighttime shots and it's very hard to do it's okay it's very easy to do if you don't have animals in the picture <laughs> yeah, but there's no movement yeah. <laughs> tr trying to do it with a snake um i needed a few seconds where the snake sat completely still mm -hmm. and lucky it was a fairly cool night there wasn't much moving uh usually i would be i was actually looking for a, a death adder um on this night but there wasn't anything moving and the moon, moon was starting to rise and not many people know this, but generally speaking with a full moon, there's less nocturnal mm -hmm. uh, rep reptile activity. Because they can um, be seen, right? 
they can be seen, you know, they, they prefer under the cover of darkness. And, and there is a connection between moon phases and activity with certain species. Um, but, you know, no one can really, no one's really, fig- or science hasn't really figured it out yet. They just know that there's generally less activity on a moon, moonlit night. So when I found this python earlier on in the night, I was like, you know what? I'm probably not going to find my death adder tonight because it's crap conditions. I'm just going to spend the time and just get a nice shot of of this um, um, black-headed python because I just wanted to, to represent it at night. I've got, you know, dusk shots of this snake where I've got the sun in the background and it's just going down um, and I just didn't have any of night. So I thought I'd, I'd do this one and it actually turned out to be one of my best photos yet. Um, I, I nailed the moon in the background and uh, the snake did give me that three seconds where it stayed still. <laughs> and, Which is impressive uh, for these guys. Yeah. Uh, the one I always had moved a lot. so <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it did move a lot, um, but there was a, a moment there where it just sort of chilled out and, and, and calmed down and uh, I was able to fire the flash, which freezes the frame. Yeah. And then as soon as that flash goes off, then you've got the long exposure just soaking up the ambient light and, and that moon. And um, that's and then if the snake moved after that flash went off, it didn't matter. So all I needed was those couple of seconds. And this shot was my first like really successful one at that. And um, it actually got the um, attention of Nat Geo for, for the first time in my photographic career. They've, wow. um, they shared this on their Instagram. So nice work. Uh, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty cool to get get um, to mix it with the guys that that get the attention of, um, and it's even harder for reptile photographers because you know generally people don't don't care too much about animals that aren't cute and cuddly. So mm-hmm. it, was, it was, you know, you've got you're already handicapped as a reptile photographer. <laughs> um, so it's even more of a feat if you get any recognition um, for your, for your work. So that was really cool. Um, the other one was the spotted mulga snake. And because I had success with the, um, so we'll go to April. So the and, spotted mulga snake, this is the the photo that you have up on the wall there that you just showed me too, right? Yeah, this is probably a little bit clearer. It's almost like a horror scene. <laughs> you know, you expect so, to hear in the background, oh, yeah, because of the, there's, really, there's fog, the moon, there's yep. these, these sort of jagged sticks across the front of the moon. So... Yeah. It's like it's like the uh, werewolf is about to come out, you know. It's like a, <laughs> but you've got this. And what I love about this shot is it just so happened that the moon with the cloud cover mm-hmm. kind of um, matches the snake's color. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a really cool moody shot. You haven't got that the big moon star like like the other one because it wasn't a clear night. It's yep. just that that moon coming through the clouds and that was really cool to get. And again, just a really cooperative snake um, after you, about- You even managed to nail it when it's- uh, The flash has obviously gone off as it's done a tongue lick. So, the yes. tongue is coming out of its mouth. You must have been yeah. so pumped for I that. lost it. Yeah, I lost <laughs> it when I when I reviewed my images Jesus. after the, you know, after the 30 second shutter speed, I, you know, because you're sitting there waiting for 30 seconds to pass. It's like the longest 30 seconds of your mm-hmm. life because- you don't know if you can't put on any external light. So you don't know if that snake is buggered off in that 30 seconds either. So it was the longest 30 seconds of my life. And when I looked at, <laughs> looked at the camera, um, I got the tongue flick as well, which is super rare. I think um, we, we love that as biologists, right? Or as um, wildlife photographers, because you just love, it puts so much more life in photos when it's not just the animal sort of dead still standing there. You know, when you actually have it making making some movement, doing something, interacting with the environment, it sort of tells more of a story. And so, yeah, it is insane with a photo like that. We the background, the scenery sets the scene, but then the, the image is almost alive because you can see this tongue outside of the snake's mouth, and you yep. know that that's a that's a you know really rapid movement. So that's insane that he he was probably sniffing you, right? He would have been like, "What is this thing yep. in front of me?" I was about to <laughs> I was about to say that. So they're you know they're picking up the scent and just. That's one of their their um, sensory um, well, ways they can they can sort of pick up whether you're a known predator to them or not because they they know something's there and something's in front of them, but uh, they don't know what you are. So a lot of the time they're doing that constant tongue flicking, yeah. especially every time you move. They're, they're sort of picking up on your movement and then they'll do the tongue flick. But it's nuts, isn't it? And they, I think from memory. 
Goannas are actually more closely related to snakes than they are to, say, skinks or other lizards. So, yeah. snakes are effectively lizards. They're in the same group of, mm. of animals. They just have no legs. And so, we always think they're a different group. Yeah. But they're actually in there. And both goannas and snakes have forked tongues because they use it for smelling. And the crazy thing about that, right, is that they use they, they have, because it's forked, it's directional. So, if they get a strong yeah. scent on one side as opposed to the other, they know, okay, the, the prey is on that, in that direction. Yeah, it's like a homing beacon. They yeah. can ho- home in on on the direction, left or right. If it's stronger on the right, they go to the right, and yeah, that's how they they hunt and also find females during mating yeah. season. They'll pick up their scent trails, and yeah, it's really interesting. It's I think called they have, a, what's the organ? There's an organ in the top of the um, mouth, right? Insta- as opposed ja- to a nose, it's Jacob's Jacobson's organ? Jacobson's organ. Jacobson's organ, and, and it's in the as an organ in the roof of the mouth. So effectively, mm. the tongue the tongue comes out. It has uh, receptors on each end of the tongue. When they come back in, that is waved in front of the Jacobson's organ and then the Jacobson's organ essentially smells or tells the brain the information. And, um, yeah, that's how, that's how it works. But yeah. remember all the old wives' tales about, you know, forked tongues and that being the devil and all this stuff <laughs> and, like, it's crazy, you know. It's like, ah, uh, science. Well, <laughs> yeah. they're just such cool adapted animals right you just like it is it is fucked when an animal can get rid of its limbs and evolution is selected for that because it's clearly better off without the limbs right the the legs were getting in its way (laughs) they're they're a hindrance through (laughs) you know and if people think that that's you know alien it i mean it is fairly alien and that's probably why people are so scared of snakes because they're just so different but it's also why they're so fascinating and if Mm -hmm. you've lost all your limbs and you can still I like there's snakes that glide and essentially yeah. fly. They'll they'll jump, leap out of a tree, flatten mm-hmm. their ventral scales out into a dome, and then catch the wind and glide down to the ground or to another tree. Mm-hmm. You know, there's snakes that are obviously sea snakes. They've developed their paddle-like tail um, so that they can swim through the water more efficiently. So that they've developed um, adaptions to every single niche. You know, the air. There's there's burrowing snakes that live underground. There's, they're just everywhere, and they've been able to adapt to every different um, habitat and and niche. And that's another thing that just makes them so fascinating. Like and quickly too, right? I think they're relatively. What are they? Ten million years? I think. I think it's like only around ten million years that that group of organisms has been around. Snakes have been around, which is relatively recent. When you think something like the whale, you know, or whales have been around for 30 plus million years, you know, it's taken that long yeah. for them to evolve into the different whales and dolphins and porpoises that we see. Snakes are much younger than them, I believe. And so, for them to have spread throughout the world and have just dominated pretty much every one of these niches, except maybe, you know, Antarctica yeah. is, is just insane. Yeah. And, and Ireland. An island, there's none there. Don't they have a little vibe yeah, or something? Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, I don't think they have any uh, snakes in Ireland, but uh, the UK has about five species. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've got a viper and uh, a couple of grass snakes. And yeah, I can't remember exactly all five off the top of my head. I don't know. I, remember, only, I always think only... that watching the TV show Vikings, right? When Ragnar yep. gets thrown into a pit of snakes, which is one of these things. <laughs> I think Ragnar existed, <laughs> yeah. but they don't know whether or not that actually happened. And you're kind of like, yeah. where, <laughs> what snakes? Yeah, where'd you get all the snakes from? <laughs> yeah, you just had them yeah, on hand. It, <laughs> yeah, they they do our head in those scenes. Um, yeah, if you're if you're actually a reptile enthusiast, because they're all these like large, overweight, fat boa constrictors <laughs> and Bur- Burmese pythons, and like they've just cleaned out somebody's collection, dumped yeah. them all in a pit, and then um, you know you've got someone game enough to sort of sit in there with them but they're all fat overweight captive snakes yeah. in those, that are well in those fed scenes. and not moving and not showing any signs yeah. of aggression at all yeah or they're or they're a mixture of captive snakes and then cgi snakes just to sort of give it that you know full looking effect and oh man don't um, i watched the film anaconda a while ago and i was just like i can't handle this anymore <laughs> Yeah, it if seemed you're into amazing war- when i was a, before i was a biologist and then now with a you know a phd i'm just like i can't handle this shit no nah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, any any of that stuff. Don't even get me started on snakes on a plane and all that crap. <laughs> now, now it really grinds my ears when I see 
uh, wildlife is presented really badly in movies because it just adds so much to perceived fear. Mm-hmm. And if that's if that's people's only um, exposure to that animal, that's why we have so many people that are scared shitless of crocodile sharks, bears, snakes. It's like if you don't want to live in fear, learn more about them. Because- now, I've talked about that with you before and I think I did some recent videos breaking down the 10 top dangerous animals in Australia and I'm like, all of these animals, they kept saying, you know, here is the... Um- the stonefish, and you're like, what? It's never killed anyone. And then they'll go on to say, yeah, you know, yeah. d- despite having never killed anyone, it's it's really venomous. And you're like, yeah, but you, you said the most dangerous. Like, how are you quantifying yeah. this? <laughs> it has, yeah. it has yeah, venom pe- that isn't even deadly. To, it's just painful. Pe- yeah, people need to listen to the words being used and, and especially on those. If you start hearing dun, dun, dun yeah. and om- <laughs> ominous music and stuff when- it's a wildlife documentary, yeah. turn it off. Like if it's, you can pretty much pick up on the fear-based narrative these mm-hmm. days. Like if you're, if you're looking at 72 deadly animals, rah, 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 you've really got to, like if you're interested in, animal, in animals, watch that, but really start to sift out the crap and try and get your, you know, they have an agenda to entertain. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 fear is one of those people that one of those things that gets people watching. So for many years, people have absorbed the fear-based narrative, but uh, it's time for a change now. And and that's why you know a lot of YouTube channels are popping up, and and that's why I focus a lot on education and awareness. And look, I might not get the following uh, and the engagement that the fear-based stuff has, but at least it will teach someone something useful. And it will last the test of time, not be some easily digestible crap that they watch for entertainment and then forget next week. Well, did you see Coyote Peterson? Is it like um, yeah. Into the Wild or whatever? And you're like, ah, oh, this guy. But at least he wasn't ever doing the fear-based stuff. I think he, he shot yep. to fame. His channel on YouTube has like um, 20 million subscribers. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. But he got yep. all those that following from going around the world and getting stung by the most painful insects. Yeah. So he was yeah. counting. So down his his from production. Yeah, his production company made him do that. Like mm-hmm. they they write the story, and they hired him as the talent basically because he's an eccentric guy. Mm-hmm. He's loud. You know, he's um. He's like an American um, Steve Irwin. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what they you know they got him dressed up in this ridiculous <laughs> kit. You know, and they've got him going around doing things that in in sight shock. So you need to shock the audience. Yeah. And I understand that that is a part of TV um, and that is why I haven't gone down that route and a lot of my peers haven't gone down that that route. And it, honestly, if you don't want to subscribe, if you don't want to be told what to do as a, as a talent, like they hire you and then you get basically, you don't get to do your own show. Yeah. So that's why, that's why a lot of people are going stuff TV I'll do my own YouTube and you might not get anywhere near the fame or whatever, but it's about putting out content that's real and that people are going to learn something from. And I think that's the, the shift that it's going. In, well, we've we've like, talked about this, I think, in private, right, where there's a few people out there, especially in Australia, that are kind of just keep taking things to more and more extreme levels in terms mm-hmm. of the the, um, the feats that they'll get up. There was a certain person who was roller skating through the desert trying to catch a taipan. And you're just like, what are you doing, dude? Like, the, and you, you know, yeah. you can't just be like in the video doing this incredibly stupid and dangerous thing that's encouraging other people to do it and say a few animal facts and be like, well, I'm educating the public. You know, I'm like, there's a lot yep. more responsibility that goes into that. You're trying to be seen by, you know, yeah. a production company is going to pick you up and then, you know, the money will flow yeah. in. Yeah. So, it is a sad thing. And, anyway, and we look, should- you know. Yeah, you're right. You, you go. I was going to say we should get back to your calendar. <laughs> going going off on <laughs> yeah, tangents. I was telling I was telling stories about the calendar. Um, look, I'm just going to go through and and pick the the main because this is probably my best one yet because I'm just getting better and better each year. And this is the next one I'll probably talk about. I mean, aesthetically, this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say I want to get um, you know a beautiful reptile with the background and beautiful scenery. So this wow. is a southwestern carpet python and it's photographed almost on the Nullarbor 
right down the bottom of uh, Western Australia. So in, there's uh, this, near- for those of you watch, uh, listening to this, there's this beautiful, is it an, an acacia tree or some kind of um, eucalypt that's like fallen over and then swoops yeah, up yep. and then down and along the ground and the snake's kind of positioned coming towards the camera down the log and it's this beautiful yellow snake and then you've got the sun creeping in sort of coming through the log with this dramatic yep. sky so with this- clouds. So it's, it's crazy. Yeah, if I was if I was to turn around, you'll see the track that I found this snake on, and I was just cruising along a track that was right down, um, probably only ten or twenty k's from the coastal cliffs down the bottom of Australia, and cru- cruising along, um, and right at the end of the day, this snake was like spread out a little bit on the track, uh, soaking up the sun because you can imagine if there's vegetation either side of the track a snake will need to either get up high like how I photographed it yeah. and and sit up high, but that can also expose them to predators like hawks and eagles. Yeah. Or they might choose to just slither out of the um, vegetation and bask on the road because it's an open space and they can get direct sunlight. So I've basically just taken it off the road and sat it on that fallen acacia tree and been able to nail the the sunset in the background and, and just so lucky it wasn't a clear day and it was yeah. getting that cloud, you know, just super lucky. And do you, do you find it harder to photograph pythons or venomous snakes like a lapids? Like, do they tend to be very, very different in terms of their how each behave or is the diversity of behavior and sort of personalities within each group, you know, it overlaps? Yeah, I... I think there's pros and cons to both species. Like uh, venomous snakes, obviously, you've got to be on your game and you got to keep one eye on the snake and one eye through your, your viewfinder and you're only, <laughs> you know, you're, you're only just taking your eye off the snake yeah. to look in the viewfinder and there's just a split second where Is you're not framed? moving. <laughs> You're not moving at all. You're just watching that snake because if he comes at you, you got to get out of the way quickly. But yeah. with a python, you don't really have to worry about that. So that's like a weight off my shoulders. But some smaller pythons, they would just not stop moving. Like yeah, they okay. will not, they will just keep, we call it treadmilling. So they just, <laughs> they just keep going, going. And you can't get them to sit still one second just to snap off a, off a shot. And that can be a really frustrating scenario. So, um, yeah, small pythons like, you know, your children's pythons and your spotted pythons and that, mm-hmm. they are usually a nightmare to photograph. So, yeah, you just need not, lots of light fun, so. and to just put it on, um, you know, machine gun mode where you just <laughs> and just hope you get one that, well, you know, has the tongue out. <laughs> well, here's here's my problem. If you don't find them during the day, uh, and most most pythons are out at night, yeah. uh, that's when they come out to hunt. You can't do that. Mm-hmm, so I mm-hmm. can only use a shutter speed up to about. And look, there there are shutters that will keep up with your camera, um, but it's just not what I have in my setup at the moment. And and usually it's just one shot at a time. Like, yeah. And you need that. You just need that second for them just to <laughs> just to sit. And, are yeah. they all just blurry? The ones where you just like it's moving around. You are just like God damn it. You know. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is you know this is a a, a fine point. You, you guys get to see the the times where it's successful, but mm-hmm. you don't get to see all the other times where you can find the species, or I don't have time to photograph it, or just for whatever you you fail at the mission. So um, every every time you see one of these shots that I've actually nailed, it's like there's there's probably five that I haven't or just you know, five. There's a lot of oh. Man, for me, I I would be having thousands. I would go out there whenever I was doing bird photography and I would shoot probably 2,000 shots and maybe 20 or 30 were like, you know, accepted. It'd be like 1%. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, look, if you're talking talking shots, then, you know, to get that shot, you might take 50 or 100. Yeah. But, but, yeah, the the better I get at my craft, the the lower that number comes down to and and that's just... It's just putting in the time and the practice. So it seems, and yeah. How how are we going for time, mate? Good. We can finish up shortly. Do you want to do one more? It seems like a, this this year's calendar has yeah. a lot more um, other herps going on. I mean, well, not herps, just reptiles. The the one of my favourite shots here is of the pygmy goanna, I think, or the the is it the pygmy mulga? 
So it's going to be Morgan on it. Yeah, this is in, an insane shot. It looks like it's on an old fence post or something, but you've got Uluru in the that's background. That's actually, yeah, it's, yeah, that's actually a tr- uh, a dead tree. Wow. Um, but yeah, it, it does look like a fence post, but just the bulge in it um, makes it look like a fence post. But, but yeah, Uluru in the background. So that one there is, I was just lucky enough to be at one of the um, viewing places of Uluru Mm -hmm. and I found this little goanna scurrying (laughs) from um, bush to bush and some um, what alerted me to his presence was um, some birds were harassing him. Ah, okay. (laughs) How how big is he? In the photo, he looks tiny. Was he the kind of um, goanna that can just fit in your hand or? So, without the tail, the body would have been maybe from that knuckle to here. Oh, wow. Like, okay. Like I'm only talking like six six inches probably long if that. It's insane the, they get the that body. small. And then, yeah, tail. It would have been a 20-centimeter animal Yeah. Um, from, from tip to tail. Wow. But, yeah, some noisy miners were just harassing the hell out of it and um, – I knew that I knew that that usually means it's a reptile and <laughs> half the time it usually means it's a snake because in my snake catching days on the Sunshine Coast you would often rock up to backyards where birds are just swooping and and, and the noisy miners are the it was exactly mm-hmm. the same bird and same alert and they're just basically harassing the goannas because the goannas get up in their nest and eat their eggs and and probably even their chicks if they're small enough um, so yeah, I would get shooed the birds off and um, sat him up on that um, post to to get the photo with Uluru in the background because you're just not going to pass up an opportunity to to photograph that animal in Uluru. Yeah, like, well, and you instantly know. You look at the photo and you're like, I know within what a few kilometers of where that is, effectively. Like, <laughs> yeah, just as a result yeah, of the background. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I love that shot, man. I'm I'm really really stoked with that one and. Yeah, this year's been a good year, and and that was during that. That I wouldn't have got that shot if I had gone to South Australia. I remember, yeah. I was saying that I couldn't because of COVID. So Detoured. that was one of the shots. Yeah, that was one of the shots. So ended up going to Uluru for the fifth time instead. <laughs> I'm still yet to go. I've got to go one of these. I'll have to harass you and be like, "When's the next time you're going there?" When my kids well, look- have grown up and moved out. <laughs> mate, mate, when you can, I will take you out. I still owe you that, and oh, that'd um, be amazing. I am I am going to come your way, and uh, we are going to tease something up. But I've every time I've thought about it, we're you're in lockdown. So <laughs> there's so that. It's, enjoy it's you, enjoy mate. your freedom. Enjoy your freedom. All right. So where can people get their yeah. hands on on the calendar? And you should mention twenty five percent of the proceeds are going to some really good causes, right? Yeah. So it's not just not just a calendar to to promote my work. I also raise money for the Raw Flying Doctors Service, who uh, saved my sorry ass when I got bitten by a snake a thousand k's from antivenom. And um, I've also recently, in this year's and last year's, brought on the Global Snake Bite Initiative. And they're an organization uh, dedicated to basically trying to tackle the burden of snake bite around the world on multi levels, like educating village people, providing them with resources training snake catchers, getting hospitals anti-venom, providing snake bite training for staff at hospitals. They've really got their fingers in a lot of pies around the world and in countries that suffer from snake bite far more than us. Like we yeah. have we have on average two deaths a year um, and somewhere like India is up around the 45 to 50,000 a yeah. year and then times that by three and that's what they estimate the people that are maimed from snake bite so they don't die but they have to lose a limb or just you know, in had, india too right that's, that's just in india then you've got africa and um south america and it's it's a huge problem and the um national uh sorry the who world health organization have put snake bite as a neglected tropical disease like yeah. they put it right right up there in the rankings and there's been some really important people lobby for this and to get the world to take notice of it because you know you're looking at around 140,000 deaths a year that's just deaths a year mm-hmm. uh, worldwide so it's a huge problem it's killing a lot more people than you know some of the more well-known things and yeah the global snake bite initiative are, are helping to tackle that problem worldwide so 
The reason why I choose both is to help Australians uh, with the RFDS because they provide an amazing service and then also go international as well and, and help the Global Snake Bite Initiative. So that's for $35 including postage from my website. Uh, you can get it at rmrphotography.com.au. Yeah, rmrphotography.com.au. Guys, get your hands on it. And, you know, it is an insanely low price too for such quality photos for some of the other calendars I've seen out there from artists and everything are always upwards of $100. So, it's 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 an amazing cause and it's an amazing set of photos. Get your hands on it, guys. And um, have you got any, uh, any idea of what's coming out for 2023? How are you going to top this year's or this coming year's? Oh, man. <laughs> so... I have been itching now that the weather's warmed up. I've been itching to get out there. So, uh, come come November, I think like third week of November, I'm off for about three weeks. And um, basically, plan A is to get to Queensland, see my family, and do some photography in Queensland. And plan B uh, might be South Australia if uh, if I can't get to Queensland. So it's all COVID depending. What what do we need to do to get you to get a rat or a frog in the um in the calendar next year? Like a hopping mouse from Notomies, right? The, the the hopping mice in the central desert there, or one of those burrowing frogs or something. I, I could tell you exactly how that will end up in my calendar, <laughs> and it, and it will only end up in my calendar if a snake is half eating it. <laughs> <laughs> because um, unfortunately, look, if you like cute and cuddly animals, there's other other calendars out there for you, but. If you are into reptiles or you got, <laughs> you know, if you've got family members or kids, like kids love them. And, and that's the beauty about kids. They love all these animals until they're taught not to. So, um, so yeah, they, they make great gifts for, the, for them. So Awesome. Well, man, Ross, thanks so much for coming on. Where can people find out more about what you do? Um, where can they follow you on the social, social medias? Yep. So just look up Ross McGibbon Reptile Photography, and uh, I'm sure you'll put all my socials in, in the in the show notes. But you can get me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you're a photographer and, and you're into Flickr, Flickr is like the professional photographer's version of Instagram. And um, I'm I've got all my work on on Flickr, so you can oh, go through and look at every single photo if you want. Yeah, awesome. And go check out the previous episodes where Ross has been on, you know, dropping knowledge bombs left, right and center. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks for having me on again. It's always a pleasure to chat to you, mate. And um, yeah, hopefully we get to hang in person as soon as this COVID stuff blows over. Let's do it. Anyway, thanks, mate. See you next time. Thanks, mate. Catch ya. All right. So, that's it for today's episode, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. Don't forget to go and grab yourself a copy of Ross's calendar. He's doing this as a fundraising event. Remember, trying to raise money to help people who get in trouble in Australia and need the Royal Flying Doctor's service or people overseas who get bitten by snakes and need some help as well, whether it's treatment, anti-venom, all that sort of stuff. So, you can go and get it from rmrphotography.com.au. And remember, it's a bargain. It's just $35 and you're going to get 12 absolutely phenomenal photos from around the country in Australia of different animals. A lot of them really venomous snakes. So, anyway, guys, thanks again. Make sure to check out the other episodes in this series when they come out and I'll see you next time.